All right, well, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's an honor to speak in front of uh, such a, a distinguished group. Uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, we hit the five-month anniversary of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The Recovery Act provided $787 billion of tax cuts and government spending, or roughly 5% of GDP, making it the boldest countercyclical fiscal stimulus in American history. It was a central piece of the administration's wide-ranging program to rescue the economy from the worst recession since the Great Depression and to build the foundation for a stronger, more durable prosperity. Well, over the spring and the summer, there's been a lot of chatter about what the Recovery Act was doing and how well it was working. And I'd like to spend a little time this morning presenting a clear-eyed assessment of what it's accomplished and what we can expect going forward. This week is a natural time for such an assessment coming on the heels of last Friday's GDP report. This report gave us our first look at overall economic performance in the second quarter of this year and a clearer sense of the depth of the recession over the past five quarters. Now, in a, in a somewhat unusually whimsical moment, I sent in as the title for my talk, So, Is It Working? And though it may destroy some of the suspense, I thought, given the provocative title, I should probably get straight to the answer. Absolutely. The Recovery Act, together with the actions taken by the Treasury and the Federal Reserve to stabilize financial markets uh, and the housing sector, is helping to slow the decline and change the trajectory of the economy. It's providing a crucial lift to aggregate demand at a time when the economy needs it most. And we anticipate that the effects will build through the end of this year and the beginning of the next. Well, let me begin by discussing the motivation for the fiscal stimulus and the logic behind its design. The U.S. economy slipped into a recession in December of 2007. The initial downturn was relatively mild. Real GDP declined at an annual rate of, a, of just seven-tenths of a percent in the first quarter of 2008 and job loss was about 100,000 per month. Indeed, a well-timed temporary tax rebate that began going out uh, last April, in late April 2008, contributed to positive GDP growth in the second quarter of last year. Unfortunately, worsening declines in house and stock prices late last summer led to a fall in consumer spending and sent shockwaves through our financial system. The collapse of Lehman Brothers last September set off a genuine financial panic and led to a devastating freezing up of our financial system and a collapse of lending. By the time President Obama announced his economic team just before Thanksgiving, it was clear that the economy was deteriorating rapidly. Now, just how sick the economy would prove to be and how fast uh, it would fall were still unclear. New data on the U.S. and world economic conditions was coming in each day. But there was no question in our minds that the economy was in its most precarious position since the Great Depression. At a meeting in Chicago in mid-December, we urged the president-elect to hit the financial crisis and the burgeoning recession with as much force as possible. Now, the cornerstone of our suggested response was a bold fiscal stimulus. Our reasoning was simple. The Federal Reserve had done a great deal to stimulate demand and to help ease the credit crisis following Lehman's collapse. But by mid-December, the Fed was running low on ammunition. The federal funds rate was near zero, and the Fed had created a multitude of special lending facilities. With the dramatic fall in household wealth and the rapid spread of the downturn to our key trading partners, there was no realistic prospect that the private sector would generate a turnaround in demand anytime soon. Thus, although stabilizing the financial system and helping distressed homeowners was essential, it would not be enough. We needed to bring in the other main tool that a government has to counteract a cataclysmic decline in aggregate demand, fiscal stimulus. Now, in the past few months, some have tried to portray fiscal stimulus as an exotic tool with a questionable pedigree. It is, in fact, a tried and true remedy supported by economists across the political spectrum. To use a medical analogy, fiscal stimulus is a well-tested antibiotic, not some newfangled gene therapy. The economic theory of how tax cuts and increases in government spending can help to counteract a recession is almost as widely accepted as any in economics, practically up there with supply and demand and the quantity theory of money. 
Fiscal stimulus has been used to help weak economies by presidents of both parties. Franklin Roosevelt increased public work spending greatly as part of the New Deal. Dwight Eisenhower expanded the highway, interstate highway program and accelerated other types of spending to try to counteract the 1958 recession. And both Gerald Ford in 1975 and George W. Bush in 2001 used tax cuts to help end recessions. There's also ample evidence that fiscal stimulus works. Many studies have been done over the years to try to measure the effects of stimulus. These studies show strong impacts of both tax cuts and changes in government spending. Now this sense that fiscal stimulus is the obvious step to take when the economy is in decline and conventional monetary policy has been exhausted is borne out by the actions of other countries. So this figure uh, shows uh, the, the size of fiscal expansions in a number of countries in 2009. Virtually ev what you see from this is that virtually every country has enacted fiscal expansion during the current crisis. They've done so because it works. Well, the fiscal stimulus that the administration worked with Congress to create was not only bold, but well conceived. The president aimed for a package that was large and got good employment bang for the fiscal buck. It was designed to provide lift for at least uh, two years because we knew the economy was likely to face an extended period of weakness. And the president insisted that the spending be genuinely useful. At a time when the budget deficit was already large, we could not afford to create jobs by digging ditches and filling them in. Government spending had to satisfy genuine needs and leave us with useful public investments. Now the final legislation was very well diversified. Some of our critics seem to have missed the fact that roughly a third of the $787 billion took the form of tax cuts for American families and businesses. Another third was aid to state governments to help them keep workers employed and to not raise taxes, and aid to people directly hurt through, by the recession through programs such as extended unemployment insurance. As state budgets have swung into extreme deficit and unemployment rates have risen sharply, both of these types of spending look even more crucial than they did back in December and January. Finally, roughly one third of the stimulus package was for public investments. Now much of this spending was for conventional infrastructure, roads, bridges, water projects, but some was more uniquely 21st century, investments in R&D, health information technology, and a smarter electrical grid. All right, well so far I've reminded you of why we took the actions we did, why we worked so hard to pass the Recovery Act. Let me turn to the question I started with. So, is it working? Well, the first thing to say is that the money is absolutely going out the door quickly. As of the end of June, more than $100 billion has been spent. Those numbers are rising each week and we are on track to have spent 70% of the total by the end of next fiscal year. And I know that some believe that the government can never do things well, but the program really is a model of efficiency and transparency. The recovery.gov website provides an honest and thorough accounting of what's getting done. The biggest problem so far occurred when a blogger misinterpreted an entry and reported that we'd spent a million dollars for two pounds of ham. Uh, it turns out that it was for 760,000 pounds of ham in two pound packages uh, that went to food banks and soup kitchens. We think a pretty good a value at a dollar, about $1.50 a pound. I can tell you that the vice president is a man on a mission and is determined to get every dollar, uh, every dollar will go out quickly to the high value projects that it was designed for. And the program is working. Millions of unemployed workers have seen an extra $25 a week in their unemployment insurance checks. 95% of American households saw a tax cut in their paychecks starting on April 1st. My father and all the other Social Security recipients and veterans got their $250 stimulus check in May. State and local government employees like teachers, firefighters, and police officers who were scheduled to be laid off are still working because of the increase in federal spending to the states. 2,500 road construction projects are underway. I believe that soon the Recovery, si uh, the recovery Act signs that we see popping up everywhere will be as ubiquitous as the NRA Blue Eagle once were uh, back in the 1930s. All right, well, even if the Recovery Act is working in the concrete, on-the-ground sense, 
there's still the question of whether we can see it in the overall performance of the economy. And here I can't resist pointing out a fallacy in a common critique. Uh, throughout the spring, I frequently heard people say, the unemployment rate is even higher than you all predicted without stimulus. That means the policy isn't working and may actually be making things worse. Well, that argument is, to quote a recent New York Times editorial, just plain silly. Uh, to understand why, let me give you an analogy. Suppose that you go to your doctor for a strep throat and he or she prescribes an antibiotic. Sometime after you get the prescription and maybe even after you've taken the first pill, your fever spikes. Do you decide that the medicine was useless? Do you conclude that the antibiotic caused your infection to get worse? Surely not. You probably conclude that the illness was more serious than you or your doctor thought and are very glad you saw the doctor and started taking the medicine when you did. Well, that was exactly the situation with the economy. It is true that the US and world economies went down much faster last fall and winter than we and almost all forecasters expected. The revised GDP statistics show that the actual decline in GDP growth in the third and fourth quarters of last year was about twice as large as the preliminary estimates we had at the time indicated. And the rise in the unemployment rate has been exceptionally large even given the large uh, fall in GDP that we now know occurred. The fact that the economy deteriorated between January, when we were doing our forecast, and the end of March simply reinforces how crucial it was that we took actions when we did. Well now, having gotten that off my chest, let me return to the question. A little more than five months after the Recovery Act was passed, can we see the effects on the macroeconomy? And again, the answer is almost surely yes. Now the reason I say almost surely is because the Recovery Act has only been in effect for about five months. And that means we really only have one quarter of economic uh, data or data on economic outcomes. And if there's one thing I have learned in the past six months, it's not to read too much into any one number. But with that disclaimer in mind, let me show you a graph of, uh, the, un uh, of the growth rate of real GDP. And what you see is after falling considerably, and indeed progressively more deeply in each uh, of the three quarters before the most recent one, the fall in GDP moderated substantially. After declining at an annual rate of 6.4% in the first quarter of 2009, it fell at a rate of 1% in the second quarter. Now to be sure, the economy is far from healthy and we obviously have a tremendous distance to go Real GDP, after all, is still declining. But economies don't switch from rapid decline to robust growth all at once. Given what we now know about the frightening momentum uh, of economic decline in the first quarter, it would have been hard for the economy to stabilize much faster than it has. Now this graph shows you the growth rate, that shows you the change in the growth rate of real GDP for the last 25 years. The rise in GDP growth from the first quarter to the second was the largest in almost a decade and the second largest in the past quarter century. All right, now this picture shows the change in payroll employment over the recession. A key indicator of just how brutal this recession has been is the fact that in the first quarter of this year, we lost nearly 700,000 jobs per month. In the second quarter, we lost on average 436,000 jobs per month. This rate of job loss is horrendous. But the change does suggest that we are on the right trajectory. This figure, again, shows the change in the change in employment. Right? And the movement in job loss from the first quarter to the second was the largest in almost 30 years. In other words, after we administered the medicine, the economy that was in free fall stabilized. Uh, stabilized substantially and now looks as though it could begin to recover in the second half of the year. Of course, identifying the effects of the Recovery Act from the behavior of just a few data points is inherently difficult. We don't observe what would have happened in the absence of fiscal stimulus. One way to try to add rigor to the analysis uh, of the behavior of key indicators is to do a more formal econometric forecasting exercise. And there are, of course, various ways to do such an exercise, but let me discuss the results of a typical one. 
We forecast the usual behavior of GDP and employment jointly using data from 1990 through 2007. And then what we're going to do is forecast GDP growth and average job loss in the second quarter of 2009 using actual data up through the, fourth, uh, through the first quarter of the year. All right, well, what this picture shows is uh, the, the forecast of employment change, that's the light blue, uh, that's the light blue bar, using this procedure. All right, well, what the baseline forecast implies is further substantial job loss in the second quarter. Indeed, based on just the past history, right, the implied average monthly decline uh, that we would have predicted for the second quarter was about 600,000 jobs. What you see, that's the dark blue line, is what actual job loss was in the second quarter. It came in substantially lower than the forecast. These calculations imply that employment is now about 485,000 jobs above what it otherwise would have been in the second quarter of 2009. This number is very similar to Mark Zandi's estimate that stimulus added roughly half a million jobs in the second quarter relative to what otherwise would have occurred. I do, however, want to be very cautious. The approach we used is just one of a number of sensible ways of predicting what would have happened in the absence of stimulus. Other methods could lead to somewhat different estimates of the jobs impact of the program in its first full quarter of operation. But the clear implication is the program is working. Now, the results for this forecasting exercise for real GDP are shown here. All right, so again, the dark blue lines are actual data. The light blue line is our forecast. And what past history says based on the usual behavior of, of employment and GDP. Past history predicts that real GDP would continue to decline at a substantial rate in the second quarter. The projected decline is 3.3%, again, substantially worse than the actual decline, which was 1%. This way of specifying the baseline confirms that something unusual happened in the second quarter. GDP growth was 2.3 percentage points higher then the usual time series behavior of GDP would lead one to expect. Private forecasters across the political and methodological spectrum attribute much of the unusual behavior of GDP to the Recovery Act. This table shows you uh, that, that, that analysts estimate that the fiscal stimulus added somewhere between two and three percentage points to real GDP growth in the second quarter. Now, if you look at the different pieces of GDP, you can see telltale signs of the Recovery Act's role in stabilizing the economy. So this figure shows you the contribution of each of the main components of GDP to overall growth in the first and second quarter of this year. I think the, the role of the Recovery Act is clearest in state and local spending. Sharp falls in revenues and balanced budget requirements have been forcing state and local governments to tighten their belts significantly. But state and local government spending actually rose at a healthy 2.4% annual rate in the second quarter of 2009. No one can doubt that the $33 billion of state fiscal relief that's already gone out thanks to the Recovery Act is a key source of this increase. Another area where the role of the Recovery Act seems clear is in business fixed investment. Firms' purchases of everything from machines to software to structures. A key source of the more modest decline in GDP is in the second quarter is that this type of investment, which had fallen a mind-boggling 39% uh, annual rate in the first quarter, fell at a much more moderate 9% uh, rate in the second quarter. One important component of the Recovery Act was investment incentives, such as bonus depreciation. Businesses received about $14 billion of tax relief uh, in the second quarter, and this may have contributed to the slower investment decline. For the personal consumption component of GDP, the picture is more nuanced. Consumption fell sharply in the second half of the year, but has largely stabilized, the second half of last year, but has largely stabilized despite rising unemployment and falling GDP. The making work pay tax cut and the improvements in confidence as a result of the Recovery Act and the administration's other actions almost surely contributed to this stabilization. At the same time, the fact that consumption fell slightly in the second quarter uh, after rising slightly in the first quarter 
could be a sign that households are initially using the tax cut mainly to increase their saving and pay off debt. We'll obviously be monitoring the behavior of consumers closely as we move forward. All right, well, because the evidence from the path of the economy over time can't set settle the issue of what the effects of the Recovery Act have been, it's helpful to also look at other types of data. In particular, I want to mention two kinds of comparative evidence. The first involves comparisons across countries. Countries' responses to the crisis have varied substantially. One can therefore ask the question whether countries that have responded more aggressively seem to be recovering more quickly. To get evidence at this, we started with a set of forecasts of growth in the second quarter of this year that were made way back last November, after the crisis had hit, but before countries had formulated their policy response. We then collected analysts' recent best guesses for what second quarter growth will be in those same countries. And what this figure shows is the relationship um, between how countries' second quarter growth prospects have changed from what was expected back in last November and the country's discretionary fiscal stimulus in 2009. Well, the fact that those points lie along an upward sloping line shows that on average, things have improved more in countries that adopted bigger, bigger stimulus packages. And the relationship is sizable. On average, a country with a stimulus that's larger by 1% of GDP has expected real GDP growth in the second quarter that's about two percentage points higher relative to the November forecast. A second comparison that we examine involves individual states in the U.S. The largest portion of aid to the states under the Recovery Act so far has taken the form of additional matching funds for state Medicaid spending. So what this figure shows you is the correlation between employment growth from February to June in a state and the size of those extra matching funds per capita. What you're supposed to see that is, is that on average, states that received more funds lost fewer jobs. Now there's an obvious element of reverse causation that's pushing the relationship in the other way. States whose economies are weaker tend to get more of these funds. But preliminary al analysis by several members of my staff uh, addresses this issue by focusing on a subset of the spending that isn't uh, a response to states' economic conditions. They find that the results hold up well. More spending is associated with less job loss. Well, obviously, this is a very preliminary analysis of the data across countries and states, and it doesn't account for all the factors that may be at work. But our first look at these numbers provides further evidence that stimulus spurs recovery. All right, well, so much of what I've discussed so far is focused on the role of the Recovery Act um, in moderating the GDP decline and in saving jobs in the second quarter of 2009. The obvious next question is, well, what can we expect going forward? Well, first, the impact of the Recovery Act will almost surely increase over the next several quarters. We expect the fiscal stimulus to be roughly $100 billion in each of the next five quarters. The impact of this steady stimulus, however, will increase over time because the multiplier effect tends to rise for a substantial period uh, before it begins to wane. Also, the composition of the stimulus will be changing towards components with larger short-run effects. The early stimulus was weighted more heavily towards tax changes uh, and state fiscal relief, whereas going forward, there will be more direct government investments. These direct investments have a short-run effect roughly 60% larger uh, than the tax cuts. Second thing we can expect going forward, because of the Recovery Act, other rescue measures that we've taken, and the economy's natural resilience, most forecasters are now predicting that GDP growth is likely to turn positive by the end of the year. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke seconded this opinion in recent congressional testimony. However, as is always the case, especially around a turning point, there is substantial uncertainty to this forecast, and there's even greater uncertainty about how strong the recovery is likely to be. Third, it's important to realize that job growth will almost surely lag the turnaround in real GDP growth. The consensus forecast is for the, unemployment, er, for the employment and unemployment statistics that we get tomorrow to show that the U.S. economy continued to lose hundreds of thousands of jobs in July. 
Given that GDP growth was still negative in the second quarter, this is all but inevitable, and it's unacceptable. Unfortunately, even once GDP, GDP begins to grow, it will likely take still longer for unemployment to stop uh, rising, or for employment to stop falling and begin to rise. Fourth, and crucially, given how far the economy has declined, the recovery will be a long, hard process. Even if GDP growth is relatively robust going forward, it will take a substantial time to restore employment to normal and to bring the unemployment rate back down to usual levels. But the President is committed to job creation, and this is and has been the focal part of our efforts. The bottom line is we are no doubt in, uh, in for more turbulent times. The actions we've taken, particularly the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, have clearly changed the trajectory that we're on. They're doing what the President always said needed to be our top priority, rescuing an economy on the edge of the Second Great Depression. And I firmly believe that when the history of this period is written, the Recovery Act will be seen as the beginning of the end of this terrible economic crisis. Well, the, the focus of my talk this morning has been on the Recovery Act as a lifesaver. And it, it is a central part of our strategy to rescue the economy, complementing our efforts to stabilize the financial system, restart lending, and help homeowners in distress. The President's always made clear that rescue is not enough. The U.S. had problems even before the current crisis. For this reason, the administration is working with Congress to help rebuild the economy better. It's as if when you went to the doctor for that strep throat, he discovered you had high blood pressure as well. The antibiotic was great for the infection, but he prescribed other medicine, a better diet, and a healthy dose of exercise uh, for the blood pressure. Well, that's what the President's trying to do for the economy. He's urging health care reform to slow the growth rate of spending, uh, tame the budget deficit, and provide all Americans with secure health insurance coverage. We're working with Congress to pass financial regulatory reform to make sure that we never again walk as close to the edge of a cliff as we did last September. And we're committed to comprehensive energy and climate legislation to stimulate the move to renewable energy and combat climate change. In, so, in short, we are urging serious medicine for serious economic problems. If we can accomplish these important changes, we will not only come through the current crisis, we will emerge even stronger and healthier than before. Thank you. Ask a few questions and please uh, fill out cards and, and hand up the cards and then I'll go through those. Um, first question we have is um, in light of your comments on the economic stimulus bill, is there anything that the administration would have done differently if it had recognized how deep the economy, economy's problems were going to be in changing the way the legislation was drafted? Is there anything that you would have changed in light of hindsight and how that bill was actually formulated? I think one of the things I tried to describe is I think we uh, tried to hit this thing with as much force as we could. We did know it was uh, a very serious economic downturn. We also very much were aiming at what could we get out the door very quickly, and that's why things like the tax cut, the state fiscal relief were so terrific, precisely because uh, they did get out the door, uh, they did get out the door quickly. I think the, the other thing that I'd, I'd want to say in answer to that is, you know, I very much want to give the sense that right, the Recovery Act is a piece of a much bigger plan, right? So the, all of the work that Secretary Geithner and the rest of the administration did to help rescue the financial system, the housing program, all of those were things that we did precisely because uh, as we saw the, the economy uh, getting sicker, we knew that it needed, it needed everything we could, we could give it. Okay. Um, next question is, um you didn't exactly predict what your own or give your own views on when you thought we would be in positive GDP uh, territory. Would you be willing to say we will be in positive GDP territory in the fourth quarter, the first quarter, the second quarter, or you're not going to say? <laughs> I will tell you that I think the consensus forecast is doing very well, uh, that they're predicting we will see it before the end of this year, and I think that is a, a reasonable okay. prediction. Next question is, was the administration blindsided by the CBO analysis on the cost of the health care legislation, and what is an acceptable 10-year cost for the health care legislation? 
All right, again, with wide-ranging questions. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, the CBO is doing its job, which is trying to give Congress estimates of, of what they think bills will do. I think it is important to realize that CBO's job is really to think about the 10-year the, the budget window. And here we are in complete agreement with them that uh, we have said from the beginning that, that anything we do on health care, any investments we make, any expansion of coverage absolutely has to be paid for in that 10-year budget window with hard, scorable savings that CBO says are there, uh, with revenue uh, changes that, that are there. So that is, is completely a, a, a place where we're in, in complete agreement. And I think their numbers on things like um, the kind of reforms we've been talking about for Medicare absolutely line up with ours. I think where we might have a difference is much more on the longer run, because if you look at uh, sort of the long run budget projections, what you know is the number one problem we have is skyrocketing health care costs. And that's why so much of what the President has been trying to do with the health reform act as it, or the, the legislation as it's going forward, is to make sure that there are all the things that health economists say need to be there to slow the growth rate of costs. That's why we've proposed the Independent Medicare Advisory Council, a, a structural change uh, to, to really give us a, a chance at, at slowing the growth rate of costs. So we think those are important. I think CBO inherently doesn't tend to, you know, to do long-run projections. So we're going to have to go with what the experts, what the health economists tell us, that things like investments in health information technology, these institutional changes that we've talked about, delivery reforms, all of those things, they tell us absolutely will slow the growth rate of costs, and we feel absolutely need to be in, in any legislation. Can you give us a hint about whether the unemployment rate is likely to hit double digits when the numbers come out, and when do you think it will recede to the pre-recession level of 4.5%? Uh, <laughs> all right, so the first thing to say, I have not seen any numbers, uh, so they do come out tomorrow. Um, and I'm not going to make any predictions other than to tell you that certainly what the what the, the forecasts, what market experts are telling us is that we lo will lose hundreds of thousands of jobs. I know they are anticipating that the unemployment rate will go up. I mean, it does emphasize the economy is still in a recession. We do think we are improving the trajectory, but uh, there's just no denying the fact that uh, we are still in, in tough times for, uh, for the American people. How quickly it comes back down, right? So I mentioned in my talk, right, even once GDP starts to grow, right, there's usually a lag between, we see, between when we see uh, GDP growth and unemployment start to go in the, in the better direction. It also depends just crucially on how fast you grow, right? It's not enough to just turn the corner. Uh, you actually, GDP needs to grow at about 2.5% just to keep the unemployment rate where it is. And so uh, we have to get growth above 2.5% to finally make progress in the right direction. So obviously what we're going to be looking for, what we want to see is not just GDP growth, but strong GDP growth. That's the thing that would bring it back to normal quickly. Right. Are you more worried about inflation now or deflation? The truth is I am thrilled at the fact that inflationary expectations seem to be pretty darn flat. And I actually think that that is a tribute to the Federal Reserve. I think it's the fact that we've had 25 years of pretty steady inflation is the reason we haven't seen movements in, in either direction. Um, that said, given how, um, how bad the recession has been, given the fact that we have unemployment, again, over uh, nine or at nine and a half percent, I think the, the greater risk is on the downside than on the upside. That I, for one, uh, you know, I don't believe that inflation comes, you know, we know the Fed's balance sheet has gotten much bigger. Um, but I think the evidence tells us that inflation doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? It comes from, it doesn't just come from a lot of stuff on the Fed's balance sheet. It comes from an economy overheating. And we are so far from overheating, I think we have a long time before we really have to worry about inflation. Okay. And um, ask you, uh, next question is, do you have a, a view on the direction of the dollar? Is it going up or down or staying the same? I have only been in Washington for six months but I know more than to speculate on what the dollar is going to do, uh, especially in front of five TV cameras. <laughs> well, I thought you would say that, but <laughs> had, had to ask it anyway. Um, is there any wiggle room on the president's position that no one in the middle class will see any tax increase of any type during his presidency? Can I go now? Uh, 
You know, the, the president has made it very clear through the campaign uh, that middle class families have uh, really gotten a bum deal, not just in this recession, but uh, probably for at least the last 10 years, and that's why uh, he does not want to do anything that, that burdens uh, middle class families. And obviously, no one is talking about raising taxes. We're in the middle, as I've been describing, uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression. In fact, that's why we gave uh, tax cuts to 95 percent of American families. What is true is that we have a long-term budget problem, and the President is committed to dealing with that. And right now, the way we're focusing on that is on health care reform, that, as I mentioned, there's just simply nothing uh, that is causing more trouble in those long-term budget projections than the predicted path of health care expenditures. And so doing all the things we've been talking about, about slowing the growth rate of costs, is the number one thing you can do to help every American. What is the biggest surprise you've seen in the way economic policy is made compared to what you thought you would see when you, before you came here? I'd, I'd say, I mean, the most positive, uh, it, it's been a positive uh, development, which is, uh, I'm surprised at what a role analysis and, you know, empirical evidence pay, it plays. I mean, it's something I learned. I often say this is a, a tribute to Larry Summers, who, as you mentioned, is the head of the National Economic Council, right? Well, the one, you know, Larry is a fantastic economist, and one of the things is, right, he listens to good arguments. And so I learned very early on in the transition that the way to, to have an influence and to be useful is to do good analysis. And I, fortunately, uh, I have many members of my staff wanted to come with me today, uh, but I have the world's best staff. We have just a, a great group of incredibly talented economists, and I've been really pleased at the, at the degree to which people will say, tell us what's true, not uh, make us some numbers that support our position, right? They want to actually know um, what the effect of various things are going to be, and that's a, a, a really positive, a positive sign about the policy process. Can you give us any insights about what the daily presidential briefings are like on economic policy, and um, what's the president's comprehension and understanding of economics for somebody who wasn't trained in that area? Well, I tell you, the, the scariest thing is to be in one of these briefings and to, for one of us to ask someone else a question and the president answers it. So I will tell you that uh, uh, he absolutely knows a lot of economics. Uh, you know, the briefings are, you know, one of the things that's been, been hard to get used to. There's often a, a scheduled topic. People will take turns of today we'll brief the president on what can we affect, expect about inflation or deflation or what can we expect about uh, the jobs numbers. But one of the things you learn is you've got to be ready to, to change on a dime because you may have a beautiful, you know, slide deck ready to uh, tell the president. And he'll say, you know, I'm really worried about the auto companies. <laughs> and you suddenly, go, okay, switch gears. Uh, so you do have to be, uh, have to be ready to, to do that. So they are, they're freewheeling. They're free um, I think the economics team in the White House is known for being sort of very free and open with our opinions, and so they're often good, lively discussions. Uh, but that's a, a great way to spend 40 minutes every day. Okay. Um. We're going to have some questions from the audience, and then we have a few minutes for that. And uh, there's a microphone, so somebody have a microphone for this speaker. Uh, it's Gary Shapiro. Yes, thank you. Hello. Thank you, David. Um, but this is an economic club, so I want to ask a, a tougher question, if I may. Uh, rising deficit, the trend is clear. It's phenomenal. And the ambitious goal is half this phenomenal record. Rising protectionism. Propose increases on taxes for those that create jobs. How is this justifiable in the long term economically for the overall health of the country? I feel like we're fiddling and Rome is burning. All right, let me, let me just be so clear. Uh, first of all, you describe cutting the budget deficit in half as an ambitious goal. Well, first of all, let's not lose fact to the, uh, sight of the fact we inherited a budget deficit that was $1.3 trillion. The president has said that he wants to cut it in half before the end of his first term. But about the very first thing he did was to call a fiscal summit to bring in people at Congress, experts, because he felt cutting it in half wasn't enough. So I couldn't agree with you more. I think the president couldn't agree with you more. Right? It is absolutely a problem and something we absolutely have to deal with. I think if you're really concerned about the deficit, I'd bring it back to health care reform. Because again, you look at any study by the Congressional Budget Office, those long-term budget projections, the thing that will 
really wreak havoc on our budget deficit is if we don't get the growth rate of health care costs under control. They are rising at just an astronomical rate. And that is why in the middle of a deep economic crisis, in the middle of a time when we need to reform our financial regulatory system, when we need to deal with energy independence, the President said this can't wait, that the status quo is precisely what is going to, uh, to cause real problems for the deficit and for the country. And that's why we are working as hard as we can to make sure we don't only do health care reform, we do good health care reform that genuinely expands coverage, yes, but slows the growth rate of costs. It's just absolutely crucial. Okay, one more question from the audience. Anybody? Buddy? Here. Okay. The mic. While you're getting that, what is your biggest frustration in your current job? Is there anything you don't like about your job? <laughs> it's very hard. Uh, no. I, I think I will have to say I have my 19-year-old son home from college, and uh, I got home at 11.30 last night. I got home at 11 the night before, uh, so I'm frustrated that I don't get to be at home really as much, uh, that my husband's had to learn how to do laundry, the grocery shopping, all the cooking. Um, so uh, it, it's hard work, but it's well, an husband, honor Husbands to be here. do that all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. He always did half the work. He's now doing all the work. Um, all right, one last question. There, there's been some recent news about some uh, changes in administrative policy, administration policy regarding Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We all know the importance of those entities in stabilizing the secondary, creating a secondary market, stabilizing housing prices. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing what your thoughts are, what the direction of that uh, change might be. Well, I mean, obviously it, it is an, an issue. You know, one of the things that we have uh, again, we've, we've been through just a, a, a real crisis in our financial markets, and that's why, again, in, in the midst of all the other things we're doing, thinking about how do you reform the system so that we don't ever uh, face this again. One piece of this has cl clearly been the government-sponsored enterprises and uh, their role in, in mortgages and all of that and the extraordinary actions that we've had to take. So, of course, something that we're going to be thinking about is where do, where do we go from here, right? How do we, as we move out of the, the immediate crisis, how do we think about uh, reforming those uh, just as we're thinking about uh, reforming the financial regulatory system? I don't want to get ahead of the process just simply because obviously uh, we are, are at the very start of, of anything that we're doing on a whole range of, of these issues about our financial markets, uh, but it is going to be something we'll be looking at. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Romer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, one second, I'm going to give you this uh, prize. Um, thank you very much. Here's oh our little goodness. gift for your speech today. <laughs> we th thank you all very much for coming, and uh, we hope you had an enjoyable time. Thank you very much, Dr. Romer. Well, thank you.